Well, I can't believe it, but this is the closing session. Can you believe it? Don't you want more? Yes. <laughs> well, this is the final one, I'm afraid to say. The speakers on this final panel embody the very values and attributes of purposeful leadership we've discussed all day long. We will hear firsthand their stories, their convictions, and their courage, resilience, and hope. And they will leave us inspired by their vision of a future that marries power with purpose. This session will be moderated by the fantastic, the wonderful Karen Cho from CNBC. I'm a little bit biased, but she's just incredible. She's the star of CNBC's international flagship program, Squawk Box Europe, a fast-paced three-hour show that sets the daily news agenda from their London studio. She's also been here all day at the forum doing many, many interviews for CNBC. So please welcome Karen Cho and her speakers. Hello everyone, it's so exciting to be back here in person again finally and to see so many faces, familiar faces and to have a fantastic conversation that we've had for a number of years but uh, clearly has also changed with COVID. So let me kick it off by introducing you to our panel. Uh, joining us today is Anne-Gabrielle Hilbronner, who you may recall from many years here and being on stage, Secretary General Publicis, President of the Women's Forum for the Economy and Society. Also on stage with us, Alexander Pult, who is Executive Vice President, Chief Corporate Responsibility Officer of L'Oreal. And right next to me too on stage, Diony Lebeau, who is the Deputy Chief Executive of SOCGEN, of course, one of the big institutions here in France. Thank you very much for joining us. And I'm pleased to say we have a big online presence as well. Anita Batia is with us, Assistant Secretary General, Deputy Executive Director for the UN, and also Yusra Mardini, who is UNHCR, Goodwill Ambassador and Swimmer. So very big presence for this final panel. I'm gonna to turn to Anita first because we just have you for some opening remarks and I want to get to you about the challenge that we're facing. It strikes me we've had a conversation here at Women's Forum for many, many years where we've focused on closing the gap, but we've seen during this COVID crisis that executive pay, pay in general has now widened out even further, which has made the effort to try and close the gap somewhat harder then there are all these challenges in future around the future of work. So just set the scene for us. What are we facing in 2021? Thank you so much. And can I just say it's such a great pleasure to be with all of you on this fantastic panel today. And it is hard to believe that we are actually closing out this very important conversation. So to do a bit of scene setting, I just want to remind us first of all of the losses that we have faced over the last 18 months as a result of the pandemic. And I want to very quickly just say that these fall into three broad categories and why it's important to remember them. The first, of course, is income. We saw women's income hit very badly by the pandemic, both in the formal and informal sector. And in fact, the UN calculates that about 45 million more women will become poorer and fall into poverty as a result of the pandemic. Second, we saw huge impacts on health because governments appropriately appropriately pivoted towards solving for the COVID virus, but as a result, underinvested or stopped investing in women's reproductive health and maternal mortality, something that's not talked about a lot, but really important to remember. And finally, we saw a huge rise, which continues, by the way, in many countries, uh, in violence against women. And the simple fact of the matter is that Although there isn't a lot of empirical research, it is common sense to acknowledge that if somebody is being beaten, they can't really go to work. So we do need to start talking more about the economic impact of violence against women. So I wanted to set the stage in terms of what's actually gone wrong and to see what we 
are witnessing today, which is that female labor force participation is actually dropping in many countries. And what has become really visible as a matter of public policy is the whole issue of the care burden. Now, this is something that UN Women, which is the agency for which I'm the deputy executive director, and the only global multilateral entity focused only on gender equality and women's empowerment, has been focusing on for many years. But the pandemic made it crystal clear that women's care burden, which pre-pandemic was three times that of men, has actually gone up exponentially. And that's one of the reasons why women aren't going back to work. So we are really risking seeing a division of the world into those women who have care burdens and those women who don't, and increasingly those women who have to work remotely and those women who can and want to go back to work physically. And I do think we have to be worried about that because all that this will do is it will ossify and make deeper existing old boys networks and old ways of working, which are going to create new forms of discrimination and new ways of entrenching gender inequality. So a massive need for us to work with a sense of urgency on not turning the clock back to what we had pre-pandemic, but to really constructing an inclusive, resilient, hybrid workforce that recognizes the real issues that women face, but doesn't discriminate against them for making choices that they have to. And this is going to require work from agencies like ours, from the rest of the UN system, from the multilateral banks, from the private sector. This cannot be done by any one actor alone. So a collective agenda and very pleased to be able to be with you here today to set the stage and look forward to working with many of you to make this wonderful new future a possibility we're not going to build back better. We're going to build forward differently. Wow. Back to you, Karen. Thank you. Anita, thank you very much for that. <laughs> Anita Batia with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me now pivot to you, Stro, because you have an incredibly inspiring story to share. And I want to give you a chance to, to share that with the audience again today. I know you've been asked to relive the drama, your exit thank from you. Syria to Europe many, many times over. But there are some life lessons here as we talk about empowerment. So just give us a brief uh, line of what, what, what happened, what, went, what did you go through, and why that is so relevant to the audience today. Um, first of all, I'm very honored to be here today. It's my first time. Uh, and um, yeah, so my story is I left uh, my country when I was 17 years old. I uh, had to leave because of war. In 2015, me and my older sister, we decided to leave Syria because it wasn't safe anymore for us. We um, have been professional swimmers since we were young. I started swimming when I was three years old. And um, at the age of 15 or a bit younger, the war started and we lost our house. We um, basically, I had to start working with the age of 15. My family couldn't, couldn't afford everything uh, for us anymore. And we decided, me and my older sister, to leave the country because it was too dangerous. And um, we basically somehow convinced my parents to leave. And we did that. So it took us 25 days to cross to Germany. And uh, there's uh, this really, really, it's obviously a dangerous journey, which um, took us 25 days. And there is this particular part where you cross from Turkey to Greece with a dinghy. And uh, they put you basically on overcrowded dinghies because they're smugglers, you pay them. And they get you on those boats, which basically fit for five people. And they put us 20 people with one kid. Uh, and after 15 minutes, the engine stopped. And then the water started getting in. Um, so. There, there, with us, there was a friend of my dad who basically told everyone what to do. Some people went to the water, which was my sister was the first one to jump. And then I jumped from the other side. Two other guys jumped um, from the back and uh, we threw everything that we had. Um, 
basically this trip had to take 45 minutes, but it took us three hours and a half to get to shore. And um, yeah, it was really just uh, tough to, to know that people have to do that to get to safety or basically we were forced to do that to get to safety. And after that, we crossed by foot. We went uh, from uh, Greece, Macedonia, Serbia, and then Hungary. And after that, Vienna and then Germany. And that all of that was 25 days. And I was only 17 years old. You yes, sir, that is uh, an incredible journey. Uh, but uh, from refugee, then Olympian as well, and your life story has been so inspiring, but also one of many lows and highs. Just give us a sense of how you battle such extremes in your life, but still move forward and successfully hit goals. Um, so to be honest, it's, it's basically people think that is easy, but uh, to me, I had my mom as basically my role model since I was young. My mom comes from a very traditional family in Syria. She basically wasn't allowed to follow her dreams. She, um, unfortunately, not everyone in the Arabic world gives you the support as a woman. Uh, not everyone says, oh, she's an athlete. No, they were always questioning, why am I doing sport? And when I'm 18, I have to stop doing the sport and then I have to marry and get kids or whatever and my family was never uh that way we they were unique my dad as well where it was very very supportive of us and um obviously supported us while doing a uh, professional sport and the same for my mom she always told us that education is the weapon for women and um yeah that's basically one of the things that i always remember about her because she didn't get to to you know finish her education she made sure um, that we do that. Um, but yeah, basically, um, I always think of it like this. If a man can do it, I can do better. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I always think of it as um, I, 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 have, I have every skill I need. I can learn. I, um, I am patient. I am curious. So whatever anyone can do in the world, I can do. So um, yeah, I, think, I think mostly it's my family, my mom, my sisters who give me the strength mostly to be different and to try to empower women around the world as well. Yusra, I'm not sure you could hear the feedback, but there was big applause uh, here from the audience to your comments just then. I want to pivot the conversation to, towards the migrant crisis because a few years back it was a major issue for Europe and Germany's approach of throwing the doors open was one that saw Angela Merkel and her government punished in the polls. And since then, you've seen a reluctance by some politicians to take a similar approach. The COVID crisis has slammed borders shut as well with many COVID restrictions. What is it going to take at a leadership level to ensure there is more inclusion for migrants in coming years? Um. So first of all, they have to acknowledge the problem because lots of, uh, lots of politicians and lots of governments do not want to acknowledge that the refugee crisis is there and it's not unfortunately going to stop. This is what I've been talking in another event a few days ago about it. And I said, um, someone came up to me and they were like, uh, maybe we should find a better wording for refugees because, you know, no one is... Um, comfortable with it. And I was like, the problem is not the wording. Uh, the problem is when the government start accepting and having a system of, you know, uh, keeping refugees, bringing them the safe way, uh, providing them with food, with education, with, you know, the, the basic human rights that they don't have, especially now with COVID, their, condition are, their conditions are really, really bad. And, um, I believe there are programs, I believe there are ways to make sure that those people come safely, that those people have a better chance in life. Because of course, I, I would have never left my country if the war hadn't broke. And I came to Europe because I wanted a better chance in life. I did not want my kids to grow up in a war area. I did not want, want my mom to wake up every day not knowing if I'll go back home. This is not a way of living. and. Um, when I came here, I um, was ashamed of being a refugee in the beginning. And then 
throughout sport, this changed my whole perception of it. And I was like, when I was at the Olympic Games, I was like, you know what, this is not about me only anymore. And this is about millions around the world. And this is why I do what I do. It's because I want those um, people to know that they are not left behind and we're here and we want to help. And um, yeah, I think also as example, uh, I, I heard a few days ago from UNHCR that there's also the, the program with L'Oréal and that they're working on empowering women. They are um, also working on, you know, providing opportunities for women. And they did already for thousands of women around the world. And uh, I think such programs can be um, provided for women and men around the world, especially, you know, refugees. And uh, when people start thinking like L'Oréal and, you know, launching programs like that, I think the world would be a, a better place, basically, to, for us to all try and fit in together, you know. Because who's in power helping, who's not? And then this is the way where we get equal, in my opinion. Yusra, before we let you go, can I ask you briefly for your call to action? This conference is often about debate and dialogue, but it's also about action. What's your call to action here at Women's Forum? Uh, my call to action is to empower women. It's to believe in women and for women to believe in themselves, you do not need any approval from anyone. You have to believe in yourself. You Listen, most of the times women are called crazy for doing exactly the same as men. And to be honest, at this point, I'm like, you know, call me crazy, call me whatever you want. If I get the, to the goals that I wanna get to, I don't care. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm calling on to, to women around the world to believe in themselves and to go after what they want to go after. And also calling to, on to the leaders of the world, to be honest, because um, until now, unfortunately, we are not equal to men and we should be equal to men. And um, the things that we do are way more important than men, especially we give birth, we give a life. and. Um, yeah, so uh, my message would be to empower women and like women themselves to empower themselves and not wait for someone to empower them. Yes, sir. I think you could hear that applause then, Yusra. Thank you so much for joining us, and we Thank very you. much appreciate you sharing your journey with us and also some life lessons there. Yusra Mardini with us here at Women's Forum. Now, ladies, thank you for being so patient here on stage. I will ask you to each uh, grab a microphone so you can jump in and uh, be part of this conversation and we'll keep it as dynamic as we can. Diony, I want to start with you as we pivot the conversation to how we bring power and purpose together. I want to talk about your company first up at SockGem because there's been no shortage of verbal commentary and commitment from the C-suite about tackling gender diversity from pay to leadership roles. But there's still a gap in the statistics even at your company. So women are not paid the same as men, they're not being offered the top jobs. Is there actually going to be change during our working lives? Uh, yes, well actually I'm an optimist, so, and, and more than an optimist we are acting. And uh, I think uh, what has really changed in the last uh, years, and you know, the, the pandemic made it even more uh, obvious, is that uh, it's now obvious for everyone that uh, women uh, are necessary, not only because it's fair, but because we need to tackle significant changes and accelerate the changes. So they need uh, to be, uh, have equal opportunities. And by having equal opportunities, indeed, uh, we reduce the gap in terms of uh, access to leadership positions, but also in terms to, to pay. So yes, and uh, what I find also very important is that uh, we accept to be uh, held accountable for it. So we make public commitments, we uh, monitor them, we uh, report on them. Uh, it's a very high expectation of uh, all our stakeholders, uh, of course, uh, our employees, uh, but also investors and the broader society. And I think probably one of the important changes uh, which uh, happened with this crisis is precisely this uh, bigger accountability uh, of everyone and uh, accountability on topics which are bigger than 
you know, your profit uh, or your business, and it's really how you contribute to the broader society. So yes, I'm optimist. Alexandra, a similar question to you. L'Oreal is keen to present itself as a good corporate citizen. Why is progress so slow in equal pay for women and top leadership jobs, especially in this sector that is dominated by women, creating products for women? Uh, I don't think it's slow. Uh, so I have to, to say that uh, well, ha more than half of our board is female. 60% of our brands are directed by women. Um, f more than 50% of our top management is female. The only place where we have still progress to make is that we come from 33% in ex uh, executive in C-suite uh, to 50%. We have no pay gap. So uh, I'm in a place where I feel very privileged as a woman. Um, not just because of the facts uh, of uh, promotion and no pay gap, but because of um, that we are such a critical mass, the daily life is very different in our company, I think, to a lot of other places. So daily life is, uh, we are so numerous as women in power position that a lot of experiences that I hear from friends or from people from other companies such as daily sexism, um, discouragement, the kind of things, uh, uh, jokes, all these kind of things disappeared in the last years and I think that makes it so clear why numbers and why critical mass is important because it leads to a cultural change. So I think we have done a um, huge, huge, we have uh, uh, the, the path and now we are translating this into our commitment to society and actually I didn't know that is uh, was going to speak about us. It's a, it's, it's a surprise and it's a very touching surprise. And I thank the team who is actually doing all the work to connect with all the women empowerment organizations around the world to support uh, and to do our part to bring, to play the role that we think companies should play nowadays in society, which is much larger than in the past. And Gabrielle, speaking of roles, you wear two hats here, your role at Women's Forum, but also uh, at Publicis. And we're having very similar conversations to what we've had before about closing the gap, but there's another layer on top, bringing people back into the workforce from COVID, but also tackling the future of work, hybrid models, fresh opportunities, new sectors. Just give us a sense of where you think we can power change in 2021. Right. It, it, it's, a, it's a really big question because actually what we see nowadays in companies is really so much impacted by what we have uh, experienced uh, throughout this pandemic. It has changed completely, I think, the way we operate, the way we see companies. And uh, it, it's even more than, you know, new model of work. It's really more than that. It's what is a company? What are companies here for? It's about their purpose. It's about what they bring to society. So I think it's, it's a lot more than that. And what we've uh, learned after this devastating uh, pandemic is really that we have very serious global challenges to face, that we have to be all together to face them. It's not the problem of this country. It's not the problem of this entity. It's global issues. And to fix them, we need everyone on board. And companies have a critical role to play. When I say everyone on board, I mean women. <laughs> I, may, I mean not just men. You know, the idea that we could fix all of the challenges we have with just 50% of human can, it's just absurd. You could laugh at it if, we, if it was not so sad. So that's what we are seeing now in, uh, in our companies. We are seeing that uh, inclusion is something that we, we really take super seriously, even more than before. Because we consider it's part of the, the, the reason we are operating and uh, the reason why we are here. Uh, I see companies that are engaged you know, in these issues, uh, that are reporting on financial and non-financial criteria. Uh, and, and we can elaborate on this. Back to uh, your question or about you know the way we work, etc. Something that is different is that now we see millennials in our companies, and the, what what they expect from a company also resonates with what I just said, what was explained, what you presented, uh, Johnny and uh, Alexandra. 
which is Morism, which is a new relationship between the companies and their talent, uh, which is also the fact that if they're not happy, they simply quit. And guess what? Guess what? It's easier to interview on Zoom and to quit on Zoom than when you are in the, in, in the office with your colleagues. So it's something we also have to, to take into consideration. So basically, big change in the role of companies, big change in the way we assess performance, a new change in the way we interact with our teams and what they expect from us. Can I only come to you on leadership? Because it does strike me as we look at the climate challenge that you have had associations, sectors motivate. I mean, one example of this is the insurance sector saying, you know, look, in a few years' time, we're just not going to underwrite business from big polluting oil companies unless they change their business model. That does tighten the noose on some companies and their activities. Why are we not seeing the same action at an industry level when it comes to gender diversity? Is that what it's going to take? Um, I think we are, we are seeing it. Um, climate change, I think, is probably um, such a significant challenge for uh, all of us that uh, indeed uh, it took um, this type of uh, actions uh, and, 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 you know, Société Générale, we are part of uh, coalitions and we really believe that uh, this, is, this is really the way where you can really make a difference because it's about uh, really directing significant financial flows towards an environmental transition and a just uh, transition. And, and, and I think the crisis has only accelerated it because, uh, of course, uh, with uh, the rebound, rebound of the economy and uh, making sure that uh, investments uh, are directed to digital and green uh, transition uh, makes it even more meaningful for insurance companies, the finance sector, of course, to build these uh, coalitions. But even when it comes to gender diversity, there is a lot of uh, collective work. Um, I mean, first, you have the governments who are taking action, and we are in France, and France has been uh, at the forefront uh, with uh, 10 years ago, uh, the, the law uh, Copé Zimmerman, 40% of uh, women, actually it's women or men at boards, uh, but the, of course the challenge was uh, about uh, women at that time. And 10 years later, um, we are at 46% uh, in, uh, in, in France, and we are probably uh, the leaders. Um, there are also uh, coalitions, uh, such uh, the one we signed uh, during yes. lunch, which is uh, the uh, net uh, zero gender gap, and we have uh, committed to Société Générale and a few uh, companies. Because uh, I think that the, the, the power of these type of uh, coalitions uh, and, and commitments is that um, First, it's public, so back to my point, you are held uh, accountable for uh, the commitments you make publicly. Then it's the collective uh, effort, and it's also uh, getting this, um, now this acceleration into these results, it takes uh, uh, bold and creative solutions. And by sharing best practices, and then we had a great uh, lunch where we were able to exchange views on what uh, each company does uh, you know, individually and how we could be inspired by uh, these actions, how you get, for instance, more uh, women uh, engineers in, in the companies because it's going to be an important uh, skill, uh, skill set. How do you integrate uh, better uh, young people and make sure that uh, they, they get uh, the opportunities uh, they, they want and the working environment uh, they need right. to, uh, to contribute. Mm. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's happening uh, and it's, uh, I think there is no return back, and uh, that's a good thing. And Gabriel, do you want to come in on this, having just inked this collaboration? Uh, because I think what we've seen over the years is that companies have done a lot of the heavy lifting, they've been forced to report on pay gaps, but now are we at the point where collaboration could make the difference? Is that the type of leadership you think we need at this stage? Well, yes, absolutely. Uh, that's why we're here. Uh, and I'm very proud to be chairing the Women's Forum and to see all of these people and all of these companies, uh, you know, wanting to act together. We are much more powerful together. It, 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 that's what I was, you know, trying to explain. We, we, the challenges we have to face, it's not something that one company can face on its own. It's global. And uh, everything is changing so rapidly. The environment, the way we work, everything. Can I take an example? For example, uh, you take climate change. At Publicis, we have our own targets. 
we were very proud because we are the first of the industry uh, to have our targets approved by SBTI, which was good for us. But we are not just concerned about us. When we are working on climate change, we are also working with our clients, trying to help our clients <laughs> when they are good enough to be our clients. <laughs> <laughs> trying to help them reduce their own carbon footprint. Uh, we have built a tool internally to measure the carbon impact of the campaigns, when you shoot a film, etc. So you can not only measure the impact, but also simulate you know, various options so that you reduce it. So in the end, it's positive for our clients. It's also positive for us because they want to work with us, because we have this tool. And it's really, in the end, positive for climate change. That's exactly an example of collaboration. But we have tons of this. And alone, what can we do? Just reduce our air travel or, or commuting? Yeah. Won't have a great impact. Alexandra, do you want to weigh in on this? Because when you think about your industry, lots of competitors, also lots of fragmentation. How much industry-wide collaboration is there around gender diversity in your sector versus, say, the Banking Association collaboration we've been talking about as well? Yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just have to come back a little bit because I actually completely uh, disagree on some of the things. So I have to step in here. So it's not like if we have managed climate change. No? It's not like if there was nearly sufficient action to even engage in any reasonable way uh, on what the future is bringing to us. Because what was happening at COP26 and we're all government's commitment are that's a plus 2.7 degree warming. That means uh, dangerous for human species survival. So I don't know, yes, there are a lot of speaking. There is a little bit of acting. And even the speaking and the acting is not nearly giving uh, so much reason for optimism. So what we need to do is very, very different and requires very, very different leadership. Um, then there is another point which I would like to to make very clear, so when we have crisis, like COVID crisis, everybody is speaking about the horrible consequences of the COVID crisis. Yes, that's a small crisis compared to the climate crisis and biodiversity crisis that is coming. And what is happening when there is a crisis like this, this is exacerbating inequalities. And that's not just inequalities if I'm paid uh, 100 or 200 euros less, it's inequalities that will put in danger women's survival in a lot of parts of the world, in access to food, access to water, um, basic, really, really very basic thing. Everywhere during COVID, what my colleague from uh, um, UN Women didn't say, but child marriages went up because people couldn't feed their children. So we are entering a world where we just have sometimes, when we are in this beautiful setting, still come back to reality and think, yeah, we have done some steps, nice steps for us, and there are hundreds of millions of people out there where we are not in any way. So just to make that clear before talking about the industry, because it's good to be optimistic, but it's optimistic, it has to be realistic and empowering optimism. And so the, the steps that are ahead of us need a very, very strong leadership. And I think their women have a role to play because we are very often women and men, but women are very connected to society because we were educated like this. That doesn't mean that we are naturally more empathetic, naturally, better citizens, naturally more into general interest, but we were educated to take care of others. We were educated to be interested in general interest issues. And so very often women know this reality better. And so what we need is that women who will disproportionately suffer from climate change, that they are at the climate negotiation table, which they still are not. Uh, that women can make, can have, bring in their perspective, their capacity, their knowledge to propose the solutions. And we are still there not. So companies have done a huge, huge work. But I also, we have to go, of course, still improve, still go further, challenge ourselves, do better, make coalitions, go in. But we also have to challenge the places where this is still not at all the case. I want to pick up on your point around climate change because I share similar concerns. When I have business conversations around the set, three hours every day, 
one of the dominant factors is climate change, ESG. But how many women are actually part of that conversation? You look at the new companies that are being created, they're battery technology companies, they're electric vehicle companies that go from nothing to $10 billion in about two days in terms of market cap. Are we not creating new industries that women are simply just not participating in, let alone making decisions of the future? How do we change that? Because you've just worked for many, many years in a sector where women have not been at the top. We're having this conversation about getting them to the top positions, but already the landscape's changing and banking isn't necessarily the biggest growth area of the future. Um, well, banking is not necessarily the biggest growth area of the future, but banking is at the heart of the changes and the transition. And I think what is uh, really important is to have in mind that uh, banks are really uh, fully embracing this role. At least uh, when I take uh, Societe Generale, we have decided to put uh, ESG at the heart of the strategy. And uh, that means that actually uh, the way you allocate capital, the, the, the way you uh, accompany clients, the way you lend to clients, uh, uh, has to integrate uh, all these ESG uh, considerations. So, you know, banks uh, used to be uh, the reflection of the economy as it is, and now we have to finance the economy the way it should be. And it's very complex, actually, because uh, when you speak about transition, it requires, uh, of course, uh, significant investment, significant innovation to take into account uh, industrial changes, uh, and, and so it means we work quite closely with uh, the clients. It means uh, that we are also working quite closely with uh, uh, different stakeholders, uh, scientific uh, community, uh, etc. It means also that in the way we do business, uh, we have uh, also to take a different type of, of approach and, and angles. And that's where, uh, and I was very interested actually, because during the lunch, uh, Sandra from McKinsey, she, uh, she gave uh, uh, data which uh, I was hearing for the first time where they found there was a direct correlation between the women representation at the top and boards and their score in terms of uh, environment, uh, which uh, it's the first time I see that. Uh, I have never seen data and statistics on that, but uh, from a uh, personal and uh, empiric point of view, I had already uh, seen that. In, in Societe Generale, the businesses which are led by women are businesses who have totally shifted their business model and uh, they are really uh, aligning uh, the strategy to you know, very basically uh, sustainable uh, goals and it happened naturally. So I was very interested, uh, with, interested with this uh, data and it means that uh, women, because maybe what you mentioned, they care about uh, the planet, about uh, biodiversity, about uh, society, but also because they are willing to uh, take a different view uh, in, you know, on the models and the business models because they were not part of the decisions which are led us where we are, which cannot be, uh, we cannot be satisfied with. So, um, so if I take Societe Generale, it's uh, not only about the numbers, which uh, of course we uh, are working towards uh, you know, parity and we have set uh, public uh, objectives on that. It's also what type of roles uh, women are holding. So we have um, a chief risk officer is a woman. We have chief financial officer is a woman. Business heads who are women. And uh, so with this diversity, men and, and women, yes, we are shifting the model and we are participating to this uh, transition. And again, with banks who are at the heart of this transition by directing the flows to the economy of tomorrow. <laughs> and Gabrielle, I want to get you on this point too, because if you think about when the new jobs are created, they're in technology. I've spoken to so many founders of technology companies that were engineers, and they are men. We talk about climate change, I just mentioned around electric vehicles. It's often a skill set that really is with a, a male demographic. If you think about women being pulled across into the technology sector, even they're not the founder, where do they come from? Often from banking, because that's the expertise that the technology companies need to bring these companies to market and to unlock huge valuations. So again, you are seeing industries that are created that are not friendly for women. How do we change this? You're saying that industry in the creative area are not friendly to women? A technology. So I'm ah, talking technology. about technology. I'm talking okay. about battery technology. No, no, we have this change. issue. And that's very interesting, by the way, because, you know, advertising is becoming a technology industry in a way nowadays. So uh, if I take uh, our company, we are at, we have a target, by the way, something worth mentioning. We have a target 
to uh, have 45% of women in leadership position, so the major executive committees of the group, by 2025. And what is interesting is that the top management is incentivized on this, as, it, as, it, as they are on uh, renewable energy. And this is completely new, and when we introduced this, believe it or not, some people were against this idea, which is in itself extremely interesting. But now we have this, and we are today at more than 40.4% of women in executive committees. But the truth is that in the technology part of the company, it's much more difficult. Uh, and we have very specific programs in place in each of our tech agency, in each of our consulting business, to make sure that not only we recruit women, but we keep them, we keep them motivated, we retain them. And it's a, a daily effort. It's everything. It's unbiased uh, performance assessment, which is a big problem. We were also discussing during uh, our CEO champion lunch today. We've uh, observed that performance assessment for women are sometimes more focused on what we would call soft skills or behaviors than they are on real tangible KPIs, which is not what it should be and very different from performance assessments of men. So this is a whole work on, you know, retuning all of the HR processes, recruiting, making sure that we have unbiased recruitment process, that we have women in the recruitment team, that we have women candidates throughout the process. It's about equal pay, which is a big challenge because you could say it's easy, but it's not that easy to compare exactly uh, the jobs one with another and make sure there is good quality everywhere. So this is really what we are doing, training, upskilling, reskilling. A lot of investment, a lot of time is dedicated to making sure that women who join publicists can grow in our organization, don't go away, and stay in particular in the tech part. And we are committed to succeeding. Alexandra. As you want to see more women in these top positions around climate change and sustainability, and uh, you know that does go to the technology side as well, how do we change it? What, what is this mixing ingredient as we try and bring more women into the system, encourage more girls to go into STEM? It feels like this is still a very, very long journey ahead. Yeah, because unfortunately, if there was one action and that would lead to one result, then uh, that would be really a, a great fix. And it's not like this. T societal change happens with very different levers. You have to activate a lot of different levers of change. So I'm not going to talk about the For Women in Science program of L'Oreal because I think it's very known. Uh, but what we have found out, what I found very interesting in this debate is, you know, a lot of people still say, Girls are not interested in tech uh, or in science. And when you go, I don't know if you know it, but I, I'm, I, I think it's such a fascinating anecdote. When you go back in history, uh, when computer, uh, uh, computing started, data, uh, data um, management, you know, it was considered like a typing job. It was considered like a typing job. And so it was a woman's job. And 90% uh, of tech jobs in the 60s where women jobs, and even African-American women jobs, you know, because you have perhaps seen the hidden figures uh, that women, African and women, uh, American women were allowed to do that job. And, women, and then in the 70s, it somehow became clear that this is a job of the future, and suddenly women were not interested, not talented, um, and didn't want to go into this field, and somehow got kicked out. And so that means that all this is a very, it's a very systemic, thing. And so you cannot see one action will have one result. What we can see nowadays is that we have to create environments that allow women to thrive. And so that all comes back to the issue of what is the leadership and the leadership qualities we need for the 21st century. Um, because we have created the narrative for the 20th century, but we are just at the starting point of what is the narrative for the 21st century. And what is good leadership? What is good leadership? Because good leadership 30 years ago was to say, I know, you do. That doesn't work anymore. Huh? People want, people, it's frightening. If somebody tells you, I know, 
that's scary because he doesn't. He, and in general, it's he doesn't. Because we don't know where the world is going in the moment, you know? So we need a new leadership and excellent leadership will look very different than it looked like. Well, you just opened the door to a conversation here on this Friday night. The French government's tried everything, quotas, uh, leading by example. Is the best thing that President Macron can do for gender diversity to step aside for a female candidate? <laughs> that depends on uh, where you position yourself probably on the political board. So, um, uh, <laughs> I'll not answer this question. <laughs> Okay, I, would, I would make uh, just uh, two comments, not necessarily on, 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 uh, on Emmanuel Macron, but uh, I really wanted to, to, to emphasize one point uh, there. Uh, which That's a is lot of media training here to, yeah. to segue <laughs> off that question. No, no, <laughs> we'll, we'll come to your question, but uh, I, I wanted just to, to, to highlight the importance of role models uh, with, uh, with women in these positions. And uh, when I look at Societe Generale, having put uh, a head of uh, innovation and technology, who is a young woman engineer, it changed uh, the projection uh, of uh, women who get uh, more attracted to this type of jobs. So I think uh, role models uh, play a, a, a significant uh, role in, in, in really making sure that uh, you know, there are not uh, jobs for women and jobs for men. It's uh, just a mental representation. So and then as far as um, quotas are, are, are concerned, you know, it's, we always say the same thing. As, as women, we hate quotas, but we really like what they do. And if I may, about technology, something I was thinking about, um, I was discussing a bit earlier today with the uh, chairwoman of the board, chairwoman of the board <laughs> of Le Grand, and she was telling me about a program they have launched in Spain, in, in a Spanish community, where uh, they have a, a big logistic center. And in this logistic center, because you have other big logistic platforms around, it's extremely difficult to recruit the best talent in the area. And they cannot find enough talent. So what they've done is they've launched a program to train the women of the village, women above 40, to train them and recruit them in their logistics platform. And it does work. And guess why? Because now logistics is about technology, and it's not about you know heavy lifting. So they said now it's easy. What you need is rigor, uh, availability, all of you know skills or talent or behaviors that are not gender based. So this is, I think, a touch of optimism that technology can also give opportunities to women. As for what Alexandra was saying, I think, or you, about you know, leadership for the future, we need leaders that are different from what we had in the past. And this is a challenge in, even for us. It's a challenge for the new generation, but you could say that for them it's natural because they are born with it. But for us, we have to reinvent ourselves, you know, so that we are future-ready leaders at our age and understand what's going on around us and acquire new skills, new way to lead, new behaviors, uh, maybe be more agile, maybe become more tech savvy, because listen even more to others, all of things that we have to learn and that we've not learned back in school. You can give me a yes or no question on Macron too. <laughs> yes or no, should he step aside? No, I used to be a, a civil servant, you know, I cannot answer such a question, you know, it's so <laughs> troubling. <laughs> Well, you're going to have a new moderator next year if I don't get a call to action. So I better get a call to action before we wrap up. Uh, first up, but we've got about really 30 odd seconds each for a call to action. So Dion, do you want to kick it off? Well, my, my call for action is indeed to make uh, really more room for women uh, in, in these uh, significant challenges we are facing and for women really to take uh, their full uh, place in, in leading. And also, I would add uh, about the young generation. I really need, I really think we need them also to participate and uh, in order to, 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 to create this shift uh, to a new world and reinvent the model for a more sustainable development. So it's about women and, 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 and young people where we really need to make space for them to contribute. Well done, and you hit 30 seconds as well, spot on. And Gabrielle, your call to action. Okay. In this room and here on stage, I will add one thing to your to-do daily list. 
There are a number of things you do each day, we do each day. It starts like uh, brushing your teeth, whatever, okay? So there is one thing I suggest we add, each of us. Each day, we help or support one woman. One woman. One day, one woman. And Alexandra. So I, I, I support that one. And um, <laughs> then I also, I think uh, we need serious leaders for serious times. Uh, and so we need serious women leaders. Uh, and I ask women to reinvest politics because women did not desert companies because companies transformed themselves and were a more welcoming place, but desert politics and they left politics and we need women leaders. And we need women political leaders. We can see that very clearly. Um, and I think one thing that is related to that is that we have to stop to drive for perfection. We have to be authentic. We have to be honest, sincere, and courageous in our leadership. But we will not be perfect. And as long as we drive for perfection, uh, we put too many obstacles in our way. So uh, be authentic, be courageous, be sincere, and please reinvest and reinvest leadership positions in all fields. Ladies, that is a terrific way to finish the conversation and thank you for the pleasure of your company on a Friday night. Uh, I can't imagine spending this with anyone else. It's been a terrific conversation and very much appreciate your time here at Women's Forum. Thank you so much. Thank you.